everyone. My name is William Meadowglass. I serve as Director of Studies at the Barry Center for Buddhist Studies in Barry, Massachusetts, which is on the traditional homelands of the Nipmuc people, many of whom still live in the Barry area. And I am very excited that David Hinton is with us tonight, someone who has been deeply influential in my own thinking and teaching and um, someone for whose life work I am very, very grateful. Before I introduce David, I would like to give you some sense of how the evening is going to unfold. First though, if you would like to be able to read closed captions, some of which are more accurate than others, um, if you go to the bottom of the Zoom screen, you can press on a button which says live transcript and then CC. Um, and if you press on that, you will get the closed captions in real time. Um, so this evening, we're gonna begin with me asking some questions of David, both some general questions about his work in Chinese poetry and the Taoist Chan orientation to the world that David has spent much of his life exploring. And then we're also going to turn to have some focus on David's new book, which is called Wild Mind, Wild Earth, Our Place in the Sixth Extinction. After about 45 minutes, we'll, we'll open up the conversation so that anybody can pose a question to David. There are a lot of people on the call tonight, so it may be the case that your question is asked, but maybe not. And it may be the case that um, your question will be combined with others. To pose a question, send me a chat in your, um, if you go down to the bottom of the Zoom screen where it says chat, you can find me, William Meadowglass, and send me a chat. David will not be checking his chat during the evening. And so if you send him a chat, a question in the chat to him, he won't be able to address it. And if you are having any technical difficulties, you can email contact at buddhistinquiry.org. Um, and thank you to my colleague, Cassie, who makes all this possible and makes it run smoothly. So how to introduce David Hinton? I meet a lot of people whose interests overlap with my own in Buddhist studies, poetry, and environmental thought. And it's not uncommon to be somewhere at a conference or if I'm giving a talk and someone hears that I'm from Vermont. And the first question they ask is whether I know David Hinton. David is, as much as anyone, a thinker, a poet, a translator, an essayist who invites us into the mysterious intertwining of mind and landscape and body and the language of poetry. Um, and this is perhaps because David has essentially devoted his life to dwelling with classical Chinese texts. Um, and in a way, if you know him, he seems to have embodied them and made them his own. It's manifest in his many translations. It's manifest in the really extraordinary book called Hunger Mountain, which is a series of meditations um, that reveals classical Taoist and Buddhist insight and experience to be native to his Vermont landscape. And it is evident in his translations, so many volumes um, of ancient Chinese poetry, which feel simultaneously contemporary and timeless. Um, he's also the first person in more than a century to translate the five seminal works of Chinese thought, the I Ching, the Tao Te Ching, the Zhuangzi, the Analects, and Mencius. And as you might imagine, this body of work has earned him a lot of awards and fellowships from all the most prestigious 
institutions that award such awards, including a Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters for his translations. And maybe just a final comment as somebody who often uses David's work in my own teaching. Uh, I feel like his work is a kind of a model of attention, an attention to lived experience and care with words that slow me down as a reader and open up and enrich my world. So I am very, very grateful to David for his work and for joining us tonight. And um, David, maybe we could start with you and maybe to start the evening, start with some poetry. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so I'll read it, like, as William asked, um, a few poems and a, a few very short poems. And the first one is the poem that um, is a kind of motif in this new book, Wild Mind, Wild Earth. It's, it's written in the ninth century by Dumu. Egrets, robes of snow, crests of snow, and beaks of azure jade, they, they fish in shadowy streams, then startling up into flight, they leave emerald mountains for lit distances. Pear blossoms, a tree full, tumble in the evening wind. And another egret poem written about the same time by Wang Wei, the other, another of the great Tang poets, uh, also about an egret, but does just the opposite. Golden rain rapids. Wind buffets and blows autumn rain. Water cascading thin across rocks. Waves lash at each other. An egret startles up, white, then settles back. And another one, last poem by uh, Cold Mountain, who lots of you know from Gary Snyder and all the different translations of him. Uh, a real uh, kind of the most famous Chan poet in China. Under vast arrays of stars, dazzling depths of night, I light a lone lamp among cliffs. The moon hasn't set. It's the unpolished jewel, incandescence round and full. It hangs there in blackest azure skies, my very mind. All right, William. <laughs> okay, David, thank you. Um, in the world, at the Barry Center for Buddhist Studies. There are many people who come to the Dharma through many gates. It said there are 84,000 Dharma gates. And um, your Dharma gate has was American poetry. And I'm wondering if you can, just to situate your work a little, share something of how you came to the kind of Taoist Chan orientation that you have? How did how did you arrive there? Hmm. Uh, well, I grew up in the West, and I uh, so I was heavily influenced early by Gary Snyder, who was remarkable in that he uh, combined poetry and ecology and Asia and primal cultures, which is uh, just an utterly seminal thing to do. And I just adopted that uh, without really thinking about it or questioning it, I guess. And um, so, yeah, the poetry that I admired was poetry that somehow was uh, influenced by it or grew out of those, those things. Um, and I remember reading the Tao Te Ching and uh, or some Zen texts, but especially the Tao Te Ching and just thinking, oh, this is, this makes total sense to me. So then I kept making, doing, po pursuing poetry and eventually I got the idea that I was going to study Chinese poetry and start translating. Uh, 
and it's and I was translating initially just to make contemporary poems. And slowly, as I translated more one poet after another after another, I started realizing how interesting and profound the philosophical assumptions under the poems were. And it's I was kind of slow coming to that. I'm not that bright. Uh, and I uh, so then eventually I I tr started translating some philosophy, uh, the Tao Te Ching and Zhuangzi are the seminal books of philosophy. And then that slowly led me to uh, Chan. And when I started realizing, uh, one, that all, all, but virtually all classical Chinese poets are um, Chan poets, although most people wouldn't say that. But they're all, they all operate with the same body of assumptions that, as Chan Buddhism. Um, and so I got more and more interested in that. And then that led me to essays. And, um, uh, and then I ended up working on Chan directly. Um, sort of in Hunger Mountain, I kind of stumbled on interesting things about Chan that I, and the Chan cosmology that wasn't being translated, wasn't in English. And then I, that's what led me into um, what I've been working on for the last five or five or so years, which is um, China Rude, a book that's directly about Chan uh, and that Chan worldview that has not been uh, translated um, because translators working on, people who've translated Chinese texts haven't understood what that, how that worldview operated or what the words in Chinese actually meant. Uh, so I've started, wrote that book, I'm just publishing a, or just, about to publish in, uh, next uh, summer, a book of a whole anthology of Chan translations that are trying to get back to that native uh, conceptual framework. Okay, thank you, David. One other question before we turn to the book that might be of interest to people here tonight is, how you understand and also how ninth century Chinese poets may have understood the relationship between poetry and Chan practice or poetry as Chan practice or poetry as meditation. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you could share with us to kind of put into context this work as practice? Yeah, um, people generally who write about uh, Zen in China or Chan. Chan is just for people who don't know, Chan is the Chinese word for the ideogram. And then when it moved to Japan, the, that ideogram is pronounced Zen. So it's essentially the same word. Um, Can I say one other thing about that word for folks sure. who may be in the Theravada tradition? The word jhana in Pali becomes dhyana, mm -hmm. one of the perfections of the Bodhisattva in Sanskrit, or was that, it's not that Pali comes first, but um, that is then transliterated as Chan into Chinese, which gets transliterated as Zen into Japan. So it's a word that many folks familiar with the insight world would also know. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, that just makes it just sends me off on another stream of thought. How um, when uh, uh, never mind. Okay, I'll skip that one. Um, okay, so people think of Chan as this kind of tradition, as a religious tradition on the uh, on the side of Chinese culture, but actually it's the defining kind of body of assumptions for all the artists and intellectuals in China, um, the Taoist Chan kind of worldview. So. Um, the poems I read, you notice that they were very imagistic, and that's part of Chan's sort of empty mind looking at the world. That's where that whole poetics comes from. It didn't exist in China, that idea of um, landscape imagery as the way you make poetry, which is pretty much the assumption for Chinese poetry. That didn't exist until Chan uh, arose. And it grew, and, and the reason it, it, it um, became the 
the fabric of Chinese poetry is because of Chan. So as soon as you say, as soon as I give an image, there's Chan there. Uh, and that's true of painting, uh, it's true of calligraphy. All the arts were seen as, ver as forms of Chan practice or Chan teaching. Um, and I guess the thing to emphasize is that Chan really was completely integrated with uh, Chinese culture. It wasn't like a sort of kind of religious tradition on the side. Uh, it's more to conventional Buddhism, the Buddhism that came to China from India, that was sort of a, something on the side of Chinese culture, mainstream culture. But, but that Buddhism that came into China got transformed by Taoism into Chan, and that and that Chan, Taoist Chan kind of worldview was the worldview of, of the people who built Chinese culture, all the artists all the intellectuals um, and, the, and the, the poets, the philosophers. And those people were essentially the same as the as Chan monks. They were all um, part of the literate class too, or most of them. Um, and you see them all hanging out together. The Chan poets and painters, if they traveled, they would stop at Chan monasteries, um, which functioned as sort of as inns. They all had interactions with Chan people, Chan Masters were their friends, et cetera, et cetera. Is there anything to say about meditation in particular, do you think? Um, in, this in this relation, yeah. in this regard, I mean, I, I, I would say all of those artists and intellectuals meditated. Um, and the insights that you get from meditation are the insights that informed their um, artistic practice or their everyday lives. I mean, uh, everything, even like sipping wine, they, you know, sipped wine. Somebody, Bo Jui, the great Tang Dynasty poet said, wine is as good as Chan for enlightenment. So that even the way they, they drank wine was informed by, by Chan. That is, they, they drank they would drink a, a glass or two, just enough to kind of ease the ego away and clarify attention to um, a moonrise or you know pond water or whatever it, it was. Great, thank you. So <clears throat> maybe to start with the book, maybe you could read a couple of paragraphs from the beginning of the book. Oh, okay. To give folks a flavor of one, the highly crafted lyrical sentences <laughs> and images that you use, but also what this book is about. Okay. <clears throat> before intention and choice, before ideas and understanding and everything we think we know about ourselves, we love this world around us. How can that be? How can we love all this when our cultural assumptions tell us in so many ways that we humans are fundamentally other than nature and that nature's only real value is how it supports our well being? There's no love in that. Doesn't love require kindred natures? And what is kinship with wild earth but wild mind? How else could we feel exhilarating awe when a majestic orca whale leaps joyfully? Yes, forget anthropomorphism because they are so like us, so kindred, leaps joyfully out of the water, twisting spectacularly as it crashes back down, playing or celebrating or defiantly shouting, I'm here, I'm me to the world, to rivals, to family. And how else could we feel delight at orcas birthing, underwater midwifery and nurturing their young? Or grief that southern resident orcas in the northwest coast are slowly starving to death? Anger and guilt that it's because of us. The noise of industrial ship traffic disrupting the eco-location they need to locate prey. Polluted seawater, Chinook salmon, their traditional prey, decimated by dammed rivers and overfishing and, um, and environmental toxins. 
We feel despair that because of so much stress, those orcas rarely give birth anymore. That the first baby in years died soon after birth and the mother carried it on her nose for 17 days above water, hoping it would breathe, hoping it would somehow come back to life. Others sometimes took over the task to let the mother rest, but eventually mother and child both vanished. Heartbreaking, devastating. Togetherness is a primordial value, deeper and more ancient even than self-awareness, let alone philosophizing. It inheres in the body itself, we instinctively need togetherness, and togetherness requires kinship. Indeed, this goes so deep that it challenges our assumptions about individual identity. For without kinship and togetherness, what are we? We curl up together and sink into that primal mystery called sleep. We wake and talk together, cook and eat, make love and sleep again, we inhabit a single tissue of language, or it inhabits us. We are positively interfused and adrift in it, and in family, community, culture, civilization. And why would it stop with our species? That's just a beginning. <laughs> Thank you, David. The very first sentence that you read, which is the first sentence of the book, before intention and choice, before ideas and understanding and everything we think we know about ourselves, we love this world around us. It is a sentence which comes back in a kind of musical rhythm throughout the book and then goes in different directions from that insight or that beginning. And the beginning is our experience of love and then trying to think what is reality as what, who are we? What, is, what does it mean to be embodied in this world based on beginning with this love of the world around us? And I'm wondering um, if you could say a bit more about why this is the beginning, why this is the foundation of this book almost, if you, um, why starting with this embodied love for the world around us? What does that do for you in this book? Or is that too abstract a question? <laughs> it's challenging. Um, uh, well, because I think the book, in the book I talk about the most fundamental um, cause of uh, the sixth extinction, the, the environmental collapse that's going on right now um, is the radical separation of um, the human and nature or self and the world that our culture takes for granted. Um, and that's what I'm saying is how, how can we, but, but instinctively um, we love the world. So how can that be if we're really so separate and then the book goes on to talk about well, what, what, how did historically, how did this radical separation happen? How does, um, how do primal, how does primal culture, uh, um, how do primal culture um, cosmologies and ways of being, and Chan Buddhist um, cosmologies and ways of being, um, avoid or um, precede that kind of separation. And where did that pre 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 um, separation come from in the West? And also what I kind of discovered and surprised me a little bit that it worked its way into this book is how it, what, how it, how it is that that separation had, st had started breaking down in the West starting about 200 years ago with romantic poets and the enlightenment. Um, and so in a sense, the reason we love the world now is because for 200 years, the West has been slowly chipping away at that, that radical separation. When there's a quote in here, when William Bradford, um, you know, before like 200 years ago, before Wordsworth, 
and Thoreau, and then some other uh, other um, sort of Enlightenment intellectuals. The assumption about the natural world was that it was evil, that it was something that needed to be tamed, brought into God's kind of order. Um, William Bradford, there's a quote in this book that when he was looking out at North America from the Mayflower as that he was arriving, he looked out and he and he described North America as this kind of hideous wasteland full of wild beasts and wild kind of devilish people. Um, and that was sort of the prevailing uh, view in the West. I mean, nobody wanted to go into the mountains. The mountains were terrifying, horrible places. It was only sort of when Wordsworth and Shelley started sort of finding the sublime and revering Mont Blanc and the mountains and um, what the Chinese call rivers and mountains landscape. That's kind of, that's kind of a revolution in, in human uh, relationship to the world around them. And that's why I, I try to work through that, um, show how that was sort of was unfolding and then how primal culture and Chan Buddhism, Zen Buddhism kind of became part of that revolution. So David, the first part of your, first extended part of your book is called how a little poem from ancient China could save the planet. <laughs> and uh, that poem is the egret. Poem. I'm glad you smile because I, I mean that to be uh, so partially serious and partially facetious. <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah, okay. I agree. But that, that comes across. So um, the, uh, the end of the first chapter, you write, who knew ethics could be so beautiful, this valuing of the 10,000 things, each in its own exquisite and individual clarity. Here it is that ethics distilled into a simple seeming little poem of crystalline scene that was written by Tu Mu in ninth century China. And then you give the egret poem. And the egret poem comes back repeatedly throughout the book. And then late in the book, you, offer um, page 74, 75, a kind of a character by character reading of the poem. And I, I was hoping that you could um, read through the poem in that kind of character by character way to give a sense of the relationship with the more than human world that is embodied in this poem that you see as having an ethics. What is, what is the ethics here that, um, that is visible in this poem to you maybe? And I'm wondering if you just give a slow kind of reading through interpretation of it. Okay. Uh, well, the ethics is that maybe I should just read the poem again. Uh, in English, so people remember it. So here's the poem. And I mean, there's nothing special about this poem. This is just a kind of quintessential example of a kind of selfless um, rivers and mountains poem from ancient China. Um, egrets, robes of snow, crests of snow, and beaks of azure jade, be fish in shadowy streams. Then startling up into flight, they leave emerald mountains for lit distances. Pear blossoms, a tree full, tumble in the evening wind. So the reason I say that that's a kind of an ethics, I never thought I'd write about ethics. I remember doing ethics like in college philosophy thing. This is super boring. Uh, but I don't know. So here I am writing a book about ethics, um, but I love it that, I, that ethics can be in a poem. So, I mean, the reason that I was talking about this as an ethics is because it's a, a poem with no, it was, it's a selfless poem. And I think once you get rid of the self, that separation between, it's the, it's the kind of Western self, which enables an instrumental and exploitative relationship to the world. Like here in Vermont, 
Native Americans lived here for over 10,000 years and the, and, the, and the ecosystem here was virtually intact. Europeans got here and within 50 or maybe 100 years, they had clear cut the entire state. The difference between those two things is the worldview. Native Americans did not have this, this idea of self and human as radically separate from uh, the world around them. And so they didn't, they weren't, they were, it wasn't possible for them to have this kind of detached, instrumental and exploitative relationship to it. The Europeans got here with all of that uh, and it made total sense for them to just ravage the world. They felt no kinship to it. Um, cutting down trees, killing all the wolves, killing all the mountain lions meant nothing to them. Um, so that's why, that's why I'm talking about this poem as an ethics. It has an ethics embedded in it. Um, because there's an, an assumption in Chinese that when you're, when you're reading a poem like this, the poem is the immediate experience of the poet. So there is a kind, there is a, there is a, a kind of atmospherics of a self in this poem, but the poet isn't asserting a, 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 a self-identity in this. That is, what happens in the poem is the poet's identity. There, that's, that's, and then what's interesting is you see the, 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 the mountain scene, you see the egrets take off, you see them fly away. And that's the end, that's line three out of four lines. Line, the third line is they leave emerald mountains for lit distances. And then there's this completely illogical, purely imagistic, completely, this could be in a Chan text, a Chan um, song, uh, like a koan. Suddenly the poem just leaps to pear blossoms, a tree full tumble in the evening wind. So it's like also breaks down logic, sort of the structures, the, um, and so the mechanism, the structure of self, which is this kind of A, therefore B, therefore C. And most poems and most Western poems do that. They, they slowly de develop from logically from point A to B to C to D. But this one just has two images, the, 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 or the whole landscape image of the mountains, the egrets, and then notice that as the egrets lift off, you can see their wings are um, sort of flickering white. And then for no logical, no poetic apparent reason, suddenly it's pear blossoms falling. And notice that they're the same, actually the same image. It's a kind of fluttery white thing, but now they're falling. Um, yeah, so that's, I mean, that's why I'm calling it an ethics because it gets at why sort of the Chan world um, is kind of radical ecological practice um, because it's challenging that detached, isolate um, Western self that, you know, to say it again, that uh, enabled a whole history of um, environmental exploitation. So, what I'm hearing you say is that the poem is a kind of embodiment of what it would be like to relate to the more than human world in this non-instrumental way, in this way that is mm -hmm. not about exploiting the resources, but about being open to the more than human world. And what that openness is, is, these images passing through, but one isn't kind of grasping them and trying to do something with them. Is that mm -hmm. kind of what you're saying? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's love and kinship. It's also, it's even more, I mean, uh, well, I mean, everyone's Buddhist, so everyone knows sort of empty mind and, and for the ancient Chan people in, in empty mind, perception becomes a kind of spiritual act because in empty mind, sight, uh, a couple of things. One is sight puts the world inside of us. It, it sort of, 
since since an empty mind there is no sort of detached uh, you know ego identity or whatever you want to call it it's the perception that fills consciousness so consciousness is made of perception that's what this poem is doing so it isn't just so it's this this the landscape the mountains the egrets the pear blossoms are self identity are uh, so there is no, so they kind of replace that separation. Um, or another way of, of thinking about empty mind that I come back to over and over because it always amazes me is, is that it's um, in empty mind, we are the consciousness or the cosmos looking out at itself. So again, another way of um, establishing kinship, a kind of selfless kinship with things. Um, and the interesting thing for me about that is that it's pretty it's quite literally scientifically true. We did evolve, the cosmos evolved planet Earth, planet Earth evolved life forms, life forms evolved uh, image forming uh, uh, eyes. So we are, when we look out selflessly like that, we are quite literally the cosmos looking at itself. And when we think about the cosmos, we are the cosmos thinking about itself. Or when we feel things like we feel that the tragedy of that orca mother and baby, we're the cosmos feeling itself. I say that over and over. I have to say it to myself because it's always amazes me. You can never quite get your head around it. Yeah. Thank you. One of the um, ways in which you just described the poem as performing a kind of radical ecological practice reminded me of what you say on page 15, where there's a paragraph, the, the full paragraph on page 15 begins, by now it's clear that meditation is itself a radical ecological practice, even if only practiced enough to see the basic structures it reveals, structures of wild mind integral to wild earth. It is a remarkably simple and direct way to heal that wound of consciousness torn from the tissue of existence. And in that healing, things begin to look different. Once mind is empty and silent, perception becomes a particularly spiritual form of ecological practice. Awareness, the opening of consciousness, functions as a mirror reflecting the world with perfect clarity, allowing no distinction between inside and outside. I feel funny asking you to say a little bit more when you said it so beautifully in what I just read, but I'm wondering if there's a little bit more to say about um, how you think of med what, what can happen with meditation as far as understanding meditation as an ecological practice and mm -hmm. perhaps one that lets go of kind of instrumental grasping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you read that and I've been trying to, to say that just before you, in my last answer, and I thought, oh, that's that's what I wanted to say. It's always hard to like have talk about a book because I work so hard to say what's in the book, and then I'm supposed to uh, say it again, and I can never do it as well. Um, yeah, and there's another sentence someplace in this book about how um, that I think some people will think is a little uh, um, irresponsible. It's or um, something and it is something like meditation is something to the effect of meditation is the um what is it someone is just talking to me about it i can't remember meditation is the is our most fundamental is that what you just read ecological practice yes yeah i thought I think somewhere else I imply it's it's not an ecological practice in the sense of saving the planet. I think there's another place where I suggest that. So that's a little bit uh, maybe controversial. Um, but yeah, I mean the reason is and is that the way in meditation you see that you are that this sort of west deta detached Western self really is a. Um, uh, um, an illusory structure 
and the way I describe meditation is, um, you know, that's like a standard Buddhist thing. But the way I describe meditation is that you start meditating and you start watching your thoughts, um, the process of your thoughts, what's going on in, in consciousness. And the first realization is that, oh, I am, I am not those thoughts. I'm, I'm, I'm watching them. And that's kind of uh, revolutionary because in the West, we identify with that, those thoughts, that kind of rational um, uh, thinking creature. Uh, and you know, there's like, uh, this all, this is Western philosophy. And like Descartes says, I think therefore I am. He, th he thinks that he's, he tries to strip away everything that you can't know and try to get to some bedrock, philosophical bedrock. And that's what he comes to. But in, in meditate, and he hadn't got really gotten rid of his, uh, his assumptions, his, some Western assumptions, because if you just sit and meditate as you all have done, you instantly slip right past Descartes because you realize, no, I'm not those thoughts. I can watch those thoughts. There's, I'm somewhere else, I'm something else. So that's a kind of revelation. If you think a little longer, if you, I mean, if you meditate a little longer, you can see, you, you can watch the thoughts appearing sort of out of nowhere, and then they kind of evolve through their upset, little obsessions or um, whatever. And then they you know, turn into, they evolve into another thought and another thought, or they disappear and a new thought appears. And then you realize that, oh, out of their, out of a kind of emptiness, thoughts are appearing. Thoughts are appearing out of a kind of emptiness. And that's exactly what goes on in the empirical world. If you see what, look at what, this is old Taoist idea from Chinese, um, that the most essential nature of reality is that it's, change and transformation. Things appear out of nowhere. They evolve through their lives. They die back into sort of the tissue of things. And wonder of wonders, our thoughts do the same thing. That is, they are integral with the, um, the physical world. They are, they, they're, they're, and then you meditate a little further uh, for, and you get to the next sort of stage for ancient Chinese um, sort of poets and philosophers and Chan monks, um, where there's just empty mind. And then you realize, oh, I'm sort of dwelling here at the source of thoughts, at the source of rivers and mountains. And, um, That's complete kinship and complete um, belonging to landscape and cosmos and earth and ecosystem. Quite, quite different from that, uh, that kind of alienated or separated uh, identity center self that, or what you know, Christian Greek philosophy just calls soul or spirit. Uh, yeah, so, and then, and then out of that, that empty mind, you open your eyes and you're mirroring the world. The world is identity. The world is the content of consciousness. And from that comes an egret poem, right? So the egret poem is the embodiment of that whole, that whole body of insight. And I mean, and again, the egret poem is not unusual. It's, uh, it's a little more exclusively and dramatically imagistic, but virtually all ancient Chinese poetry is landscape poetry like this built out of images. Um, normally they have people thinking things, saying things, but it's always with um, built out of the fabric of landscape images out of Chan and essentially out of Chan empty mind uh, seeing. Yeah, there's so many poems in which they're essentially awakening poems. Yeah. Where awakened vision, the very awakening that is manifest in awakened vision is seeing the world as um, Buddha nature or seeing the world as um, 
precisely not something which is to be grasped, but something that is fundamentally the same or similar to one's own awakened nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So um, one of the characters, one of the main characters in this book is Robinson Jeffers. <laughs> and I know from your other books that Robinson Jeffers has been very important to you. Um, Charles Olson also is a character here is important, but I'm wondering if you want to say anything about, um, well, you wrote a whole book called The Wilds of Poetry, but some of the figures in that book make their appearance here. And I'm wondering if you want to say anything about how you see the relationship between people like Robinson Jeffers and Charles Olson and these classical Chinese poets. Oh yeah, well, that's a good segue actually from what I was just saying because the beginning of modern American poetry is um, Ezra Pound's imagism. And he learned imagism essentially from ancient China because uh, when he just sort of discovered and um, uh, he sort of discovered imagism in haiku and haiku is sort of the, the poetics that was migra that was um, imported to Japan from China. That is an image of just strictly landscape images. Uh, so, these, all these ideas we've been talking about in poems like this egret poem, those informed uh, modern American poetry and modern American poetry became a poetry of images, direct language, um, uh, everyday voice. Um, and, and then from Pound, like William Carlos Williams famously said, no ideas but in things that is replacing kind of abstraction, the abstraction of Western, the Western tradition with things, with images. And then that, I mean, virtually all poetry in, in America since then, that's back in the early 20th century, uh, takes for granted that, that language, which is essentially a Chan language. It's a language of, again, of everyday immediate experience, um, of images uh, as opposed to sort of abstractions and sort of for the, for Pound and Williams, part of that sort of abstraction it was sort of rhyme and meter, this kind of artificial language that poetry was made of. They wanted it to be a natural language. Um, and yeah, so then pretty soon after that, Robinson Jeffers, who was in the 20s inventing inventing his poetry, was very was all by himself in the West on the West Coast on um, right living right on the California coast of Carmel, and he was talking about things very similar to the ancient Chinese and um, uh, really challenging the Western idea of the human. I mean, people kind of hated him because he had this philosophy of inhumanism. He he thought what mattered was the organic whole of the cosmos, of the, of, of the ecosystem, not individual human, not the, hum, not the human race. Um, so he was just kind of like a, a, an ecological um, prophet, uh, wrote lots of beautiful poems. And, um, and so, yeah, I talk about him in the wilds of poetry, there's a chapter and then he comes up in, um, Wild Mind, Wild Earth. Should I read a Robinson Jeffers poem? There's one in this Wild Mind, Wild Earth. Yeah, maybe not, <laughs> not the whole. Not, oh, okay. Whole. <laughs> of, Never mind. I won't read it then. Are you thinking of Continent's End? On page yeah, page? it's a little long. It's a page long. Yeah. Why don't you read some of it? Uh, well, Continent's End it doesn't take that long. At the equinox, when the earth was veiled in late rain, wreathed with wet poppies, waiting spring, the ocean swelled for a far storm and beat its boundary. The groundswell shook the beds of granite. I gazed at the boundaries of granite and spray, the established sea marks, felt behind me, mountain and plain, the immense breadth of the continent, 
Before me, the mass and doubled stretch of water. I said, you yoke the Aleutian seal rocks with the lava and coral sowings that flower the south. Over your flood, the life that sought the sunrise faces ours that is following the evening star. And then I'll just, so if William doesn't want to read the whole thing, I'll skip to the end. He's still addressing the ocean. But you could go ahead and read the whole thing. <laughs> The long, so he's addressing the ocean, so it keeps going. The long migrations meet across you and it is nothing to you. You have forgotten us, mother. You were much younger when we crawled out of the womb and lay in the, in the sun's eye on the tide line. It was long and long ago. We have grown proud since then and you have grown bitter. Life retains your mobile, soft, unquiet strength and envies hardness, the insolent, the insolent quietness of stone. The tides are in our veins. We still mirror the stars. Life is your child, but there is in me older and harder than life and more impartial, the eye that watched before there was an ocean, that watched, that watched you fill your seabeds out of the condensation of thin vapor and watched you change them that saw you soft and violent wear your boundaries down, eat rock, shift places with the continents. Mother, though my song's measure is like your surf beat's ancient rhythm, I never learned it of you. Before there was any water, there were tides of fire. Both our tones flow from the older fountain. So what I like about that poem is the, the idea that his kind of source or his essential nature goes back even before the oceans to this tides of fire, some kind of primordial planetary existence or something. Uh, and there he is talking about that as kind of ancestor equating himself with the ocean. That's how elemental he's become in this poem. So he's, he has the same relation to the to that kind of primordial source as the ocean does. That's that's kinship. That's kinship, and you also emphasize the kinship between that and Chinese Taoist Chan poems. I wonder if you'd like to read on page forty-seven the last paragraph, which okay. about the relationship between these two. Oh yeah, this is about, I said that, um, okay, yeah, I think you'll, you'll see this. I talked about that I traced the history of the Western curve of environmental uh, realization that we're not entirely separate from the ecosystem. It may seem too obvious to state but it's important to note another striking parallel between the cultural transformations in ancient China and the modern West. From the British romantics through contemporary American poets and land artists, it is the same as for ancient China's Taoist Chan thought and practice and art. In both traditions, cultivating and exploring our immediate experience of the world around us is the most essential and profound method of self-cultivation and self-realization. It is the way to understand one's deepest nature in its most expansive form, wild mind integral to wild earth. And as it turns out, this cultivation of wholeness for self is miraculously also cultivation of wholeness for the planet. Good choice. Yeah, well, <laughs> paragraph. Um, so we want to open up the conversation to others. If anybody has, there are already some questions that I'll start with. Um, if anybody would like to add questions, um, put them in the chat and make sure again that you chat them to me. If you chat them and if you, and what I mean by that 
is you can put your cursor up in the right hand corner of my box and you'll see I think three dots and you can press that three dots and you should see chat and then send me a chat. If you send a chat to David because he's not looking, um, he will not be able to respond. So one question um, that you do address beautifully in the book um, towards the end, um, there's a question from Jeff. Please speak about your sense that we are deeply wounded through our estrangement from the natural world. Do we have a mild, a wild mind within us still as a foundation of being that we become aware of in flashes of feeling for the baby orca, the dying trees? Is there hope for us in this primal wild mind that still dwells deep within? It's <laughs> a big question. That's a big question. <laughs> um... Yeah, I mean, the whole point of the book is, yes, we do have that wild mind. Uh, uh, where would it go? We, we're not that far from hunter-gatherers, really. Um, we just have these superficial cultural overlays that kind of hide it. Um, so let's see, what, so what's the question, really? Uh, is there hope for us? Or is it- Well, there are really uh, two, two, maybe two questions. Okay. And I mean, one is if you are caught up in those traditions in the West that are profoundly dualist and maybe not associated with wild mind, mm -hmm. is there still wild mind there? I think. Oh, it's always there. The Chan people, that's kind of sort of like Chan people saying, you're always, you're always already enlightened. Uh, you just have to see it. In fact, the uh, the Zen a lot of, a lot of you will know the Zen word Kensho, which is the word for the Japanese word for enlightenment. Well, in the Chinese word, uh, what that word means literally is seeing original mind. That's what I mean. That's the literal translation of the two characters that we hear as enlightenment or Kensho, the actual literal meaning is just seeing original mind, it's just seeing wild mind. All you, it's, it's there, it's just a question of seeing it. It can't, it can't go anywhere. Uh, um, so yes, it's definitely there, uh, you have to see it. But I mean, the, sort of the, the question in the, the second part of the book tries to work through this um, is that, what are the odds that the whole culture is going to see that? Not not so good. Um, so what do we make of that? And that's what I try to work through in the second part. Um, but it's definitely, I mean, that's what Chan practice is about, really. It's, it, it's it, wild mind is there. It's just it's just seeing it and inhabiting it. I guess re-inhabiting it. Yeah. In the book, you suggest that even the most dualistic thinking is still natural and still one expression of wild mind. Mm -hmm. It's not, and uh, it's not that the mind isn't. Yeah, like I said, the cosmos evolved uh, humans and it evolved mind, uh, human thought, human perception. So it, how, however awful, and obsessive and whatever thinking is, it's still a cosmos thinking. You, if you might not, it takes a lot of work maybe to experience that or see it, but it still is. Can't be anything else. That's that's the always already enlightened story. So David, here's a question about the poem, the egret poem itself. And Gail asks, it feels like the egret and the pear blossoms are working like a metaphor. I wonder if the way that Chinese characters join to create ideas indicate a similar way of holding more than one thing at a time. That is, is it both the image as the thing, I take Gail to be saying, and also a metaphor for something else or 
you spent a lot of time with this poem and with poems like it. What do you think? Yeah, I think, no, no, no metaphor at all. Uh, it's interesting that um, uh, trying to think how to say this. Um, no, so basically Chinese landscape po poetry, because it is, it is Chan practice, it is Chan, is the thing itself. That's the whole thing, the thusness of things in and of themselves. That's what it is. Um, they're not very often allegorical or metaphorical. And you notice that um, as soon as you start operating with language or poetry or poetics, as metaphor or allegory or symbolism, you're essentially, it, it shifts you out of that Chan immediacy into a detached, really uh, not a detached instrumental exploitative um, structure with reality. That is, you're not in immediate kindred uh, relation with the egrets. They become this, they become this, thing you can use uh, as a metaphor. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's no different than physical. Um, a mountain isn't the mountain itself. It's a thing I can use to dig coal out of. It's, it's the same structure of consciousness. That's, so I, I, I completely avoid, like in my own writing, I don't want to, metaphor is, uh, is, um, is exactly the structure that Chan wants to get you past. And it's pretty, it's pretty rare in Chinese landscape poetry. Um, if it's there, I can't even really think of it ever being there, but I don't think that's true. If it's there, it's, it's very self-aware. Um, yeah. So, Here's a, here's a question that um, gets at this whole project of translation, which you have thought about a lot <clears throat> and is translation is a thorny, thorny question. And Bruce asks, I've started comparing translations with the Chinese source and becoming more and more amazed that a translation is even possible. Translation is almost a complete rewrite or an original creation of its own. How did you come to have your confidence that you have seen what had been lost in the original Taoist Chan thought and is no longer transmitted to our views of Zen or Chan? And basically thinking about the project of translating these texts into English mm -hmm. and what does it mean to try to articulate what you see there or what was there? Yeah, read the last sentence of that question again. <clears throat> well, the last sentence was, how did you come to have your confidence? Maybe you don't have confidence. <laughs> um, but you have seen what had been lost in the original Taoist Chan thought. I take it uh, okay. about kind of this non-dualistic way of thinking. Um, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I'm articulating that exactly, but. Well, like, like William pointed out early, uh, I, I did start as a poet. And one of the things that I um, found so appealing about translating ancient Chinese when I was first discovering it was how radically open and different it is from English. It's not like translating French, which is the other language that uh, I can translate from. Uh, because French, the, the grammar, the structure is basically the same as English, just kind of reorganized. But Chinese is a whole, whole new world. It's really a new world, a whole different way of thinking, whole different structure of consciousness. And I like that because that means I have to create, really create a new poem in English. I, I take, I start with the original and I follow it very closely. I don't, but you still, if I want to make a literary translation, I still have to invent a whole new poem, invent a whole new voice. So it was like writing poetry. Um, 
and yeah, there is like he mentioned, uh, he or she, I forget. Uh, there is a certain amount of arrogance in that, yeah. Uh, but I guess, you know, I'm comfortable being an arrogant uh, creep. Um, and I don't, I don't, I don't know that, you know, after translating a lot of poetry, which is really the most challenging uh, thing to translate, it's not as, uh, like Chan texts aren't texts, aren't really as hard as translating poetry. Once you can translate poetry, you can sort of do anything. Um, I remember when I was facing, I was translating the Tao Te Ching and I thought, you know, that's like the most dark, mysterious text for me uh, that I could imagine. And I was a little intimidated. And then I just said, OK, just treat them like poems. And it'll be fine. And that's what I did. And yeah. Um, so I don't know if there's a lot of uh, arrogance or self-assurance with the philosophical text. It was just the slow discovery that Oh, there are these words, all these big philosophical concepts here that aren't being translated because people didn't know what they were. The translators of, uh, of the, all the Zen translations of the, you know, the of Bodhidharma or the Sixth Patriarch, the, uh, the um, so, then it was, so then it was just a matter of, oh, well, I've kind of figured out what these things are through translating the old Taoist texts and through chance translating the poems. And now I just have to work through the, the, the Chan texts. And um, well, one, I, and fix them. But also I always, I originally started doing philosophy just thinking I was gonna make them more interesting as a, from a literary point of view, more uh, compelling as literature. It was kind of accidental that I discovered this whole philosophical problem with translation and how the, the whole, like uh, in China Root, my last book, I have an appendix about this and I and the appendix is called Lost in Translation. So sort of only kind of an accident that I discovered this whole, whole cosmology has been completely lost in, um, in Zen translation. And in, well, and in poetry translation also. Speaking of translation, <clears throat> um, there is a question about a particular word. Um, so you had used the word original mind earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is, why did you choose wild, like wild mind, wild earth? Which I think is a great question to get at some really important themes in the book. Why, why is wild important for you? Well, it's um, oh, it's kind of it's kind of interesting because in in the Chinese context, you wouldn't it wouldn't occur to me or to someone to use that word uh, if that word even exists in Chinese. Like it wouldn't exist in a primal culture language, and it wouldn't exist. It probably doesn't really exist in Chinese <laughs> because. So I don't know. I mean, using that in a sense is a failure. I hadn't quite thought about this. That's a, it's a failure because I'm, it's to be trapped in Western structures because in the West, we use the word nature means literally, I mean, it just by definition is everything that's not human. So right there in that word is the radical separation, the illusory separation um, of human and nature of consciousness and um, the wild. So, you know, it's the wild as what we normally think of the wild is the not human. And we think of the human as the, as the not wild. And so trying, so doing what I'm, so saying wild mind is to say it's mind that is not what we think of as human, this kind of constrict, it's constricted human uh, thing separate from the wild that is so I'm like I'm like fighting against those that Western dualism and dichotomy between 
the wild and the human or nature and the human. Does that make sense? Yeah. So then it's like wild mind and wild earth is, is like trying to integrate the two of them. So first it's like, well, mind is really wild. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not cooked. It's not. Um, it's not civil. Civilized as opposed to nature. It's. It's. Um, we're trying. I'm trying to get back to wild mind. Yeah, it resonates with someone you mentioned earlier, Gary Snyder, in his book, The Practice of the Wild. Mm -hmm. um, he also has his selected poems as No Nature, which is also pushing against that dichotomy, that dualism. Yeah, so here, here's a question from my friend Jamie in early morning in Kyoto. Um, <laughs> and uh, he says, perhaps an obvious question is why a practical or activist ecological consciousness didn't arise from the Chan Zen Taoist worldview and or practice in spite of that dominance in the poetry that you described so well, but did in the Western world as you also document so well, ultimately being imported from the West into those Asian traditions in the past 50 years or so. Mm -hmm. um, um, let's see, there are several facets of that. Um, one of them, one of the things that I talk about in the book is how the, the Western development of ecological consciousness was driven by uh, um, re more recently, like 50s and 60s, sort of Zen and Asian thinking was part of what drove that transformation. But I think it's very interesting is if you go back to the beginning of that transformation, the, um, the romantics, so this is 200 years ago, part of what drove, in fact, a large part of what drove their um, their, uh, what's the word? Their um, desire to feel, to, to get back to that kinship with, you know, quote unquote nature, their, um, their um, challenge of the Western assumptions that we are radically separate from the natural world. Um, one of the main things driving that incredibly, um, and, and I didn't really know that until I was working on this book, was Native American culture and thought. That is, there, there were books being published in Europe that were reporting Native American um, kind of philosophical um, dialogues that people were having with um, Native Americans, travel logs talking about maybe romanticized, maybe not. Well, no, you know, probably definitely romanticized, but taken seriously by a lot of intellectuals in Europe and, trans and, and giving them for the first time a possible alternative to the Western assumptions about um, we are spirits that are and we're radically separate um, from the non-human, from the earth, and the earth is just this kind of evil thing that we need to overcome, et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of amazing that modern contemporary environmental consciousness really the real seed of it uh, was Native America. Native American thinking. It went to it went to Europe in these account various accounts, travel logs, accounts of um, Native American elders and what they thought. Um, people like a whole bunch of people like Rousseau, but certainly Wordsworth, there's um, and Coleridge and those people um, were transformed by that and started thinking, oh, nature is good, nature is sustaining nature is spiritually rich. Then that came back to Thoreau, from Wordsworth to Thoreau and Emerson, and then, you know, John Muir and, you know, right on up. Uh, I kind of love tracing how little seeds get planted in intellectual history 
Um, and then they just grow into these huge things and you almost don't notice where they came from. Um, but yeah, there's another, I think another issue in that question is, yeah, environmental consciousness didn't really take hold in China. Why is that? And I talk about that a little bit in this book. Um, and I think the reasons are, um, there's probably a lot of reasons. One of them was this whole body of thought was the body of thought of the kind of educated elite. Um, the masses just went about their lives. Um, and they were, they were, their consciousness among the masses was structured by more popular religions, animist religions, all kinds of um, melanges of Buddhism and Confucianism and all kinds of stuff. Uh, it was kind of different in every valley. Um, and then the other thing which leads into the, uh, the whole second part of this book and grappling with the probably intractable situation we're in is just the sheer biological pressure of um, human populations doing what the human animal does. Uh, and, you know, it's not, it's not clear ideologies can, is going to change that. Um, maybe. I don't know. That's what the second part of the book kind of grapples with. Thank you, David. And, and there is a question about the second part of the book. I just wanted to stay with this for a moment, um, because from what I know from what you've told me previously, and also your response to Jamie's question just now, one could come away from this conversation thinking, oh, in China, they somehow got everything ecologically right because of this. Um, this worldview, mm -hmm. um, but you're not saying that, and um, pretty obviously not true. Yes, yeah. there's a there's a great book by Mark Elvin, um, Retreat, the Retreat of the Elephants on the uh -huh. History of China, which looks at some of this really great poetry, and also looks at some of the contexts that were going around that that, mm -hmm. that poetry was written in. Um, and what I'm also hearing you say and reading is that, um, in reading in your work, in your book, whether or not this poetry led to particular environmental, socio-ecological practices that we think of as necessary today, um, those this poetry can still help us understand today our relationship mm -hmm. with the more than human world, um, yeah. even if. Um, and and they are also, I think. <sighs> maybe, I think. Can I interrupt you? Yeah, go ahead. I think because I I get distracted easily, but I think where the book sort of goes with this is that, um, these, well, two things. One is, primal culture is involved here, but. In terms of just this Taoist Chan worldview, it ha it, it it has uh, the conceptual framework which would create could create a culture in which we aren't ex so exploitative um, and instrumental. Um, and but it didn't in ancient China because ancient China had fierce population pressures, and it's the human animal doing what any apex predator does. However, now we maybe we have technology. If 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 there was really a cultural transformation, technology might make it possible for us to create that kind of culture out of this um, Taoist Chan framework. And 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 I also try to point out that this whole environment development of environmental consciousness, beginning with Wordsworth and the Romantics and coming up through Thoreau and modern environmentalism has done a lot of that work already. Um, but if you want to, if you want to see a um, a viable culture using these ideas, an actual viable culture, it's primal hunter gatherer cultures. Because, like I said, here in Vermont or anywhere, they were here for ten plus thousand years. 
uh, without substantial environmental damage, and that's because of their worldview. Um, and then that, this is like a whole different strand going through the book, and that kind of Paleolithic um, worldview survived into Taoism and Chan. They're basically built on that worldview, and they come right out of an oral tradition. Um, and then interestingly for me, the parallels are really interesting to me, that, that whole argument that um, the romantics leading all the way up to the environmentalist movement today began with ideas from uh, primal culture, that is Native American primal culture, Paleolithic culture. So, so the impetus, the seed in both ancient China and, modern, and, and um, the modern West starting around 1800 or something like that, 18th century, uh, is the same. It's, it's, this, it's the, sort of this Paleolithic insight and kinship with the ecosystem. Thank you, David. Um, and one may be motivated by this worldview and as a bodhisattva use skillful means of anthropocentric arguments to get something like the Inflation Reduction Act passed. <laughs> you know, you were saying this may be an elite view, but many people may be more motivated by anthropocentric arguments, which could still lead to the policies that a kind of uh, that's what mainstream environmentalism is all about yeah it's environmentalism because it's in our interest yeah which yeah i kind of like go through in the second part of this book too yeah so speaking about the second part of the book there was a question about that um that would be a good place to we're almost to the end of our time together and um, there was a question about, um, I apologize to everybody whose questions I did not get to. There were a lot of them. Um, yeah, so this is um, a question that you write that the sixth mass extinction can be understood to be perfectly fine. This is startling, even if I can see it arising from the Taoist Chan worldview. I would love to hear you expound on this realization and maybe trace some of its implications. <laughs> Okay, yeah, that's the whole of part two. Yeah. Um, yeah, why do I say it's fine? Uh, uh, that's part of a developing discussion. It's not a kind of final conclusion, by the way. Um, uh, well, I mean, what it's saying, what it's saying is, the, the reason I say that is because once you get past the, uh, the dualisms, once you get past the idea that humans are radically separate from everything else, then you confront the fact that, okay, well, we are creating the six, six mass extinction event right now. And that it's not really any different than any other mass extinction event. That is, we are 100% through and through um, natural, quote unquote. You know, we're an apex predator. That's what we are. We're just, you know, we're like beavers making their dams. So this mass extinction isn't really any different than the mass extinctions that came because of volcanoes or asteroid impacts or gamma ray bursts or um, methane eruptions. Um, there were, we, we see all those as perfectly natural. We kind of look back through, you know, deep natural history to 65 million years ago and, um, and we see the asteroid impact uh, as a natural event, and it caused the had these impacts. Well, we're in a natural event too, and we're pretty devastating natural event. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 part of like trying to rethink what we are and and um, and how we can see this. And then the, I don't think I can reconstruct it, but then and, and maybe I'll let, let, like leave it for you to discover when you read the book um, what we what, what you can do with that in terms of living with it um, and how it it is it is it can be a kind of liberation um, so okay that how to live with the situation we're in 
is uh, yeah. maybe the question will be will be left with. Um, I wanted to say a few more things, and then um, David will end our evening together with some more poetry. And what I wanted to say was that <clears throat> um, the Barry Center for Buddhist Studies is situated in a particular Buddhist tradition where we do not compensate our teachers. Um, we practice what's called dana, which is related to the English word donation, generosity. It's the first virtue of the bodhisattva and both meets the immediate needs of others and is the possibility, offers the possibility of renouncing something that one might be attached to. And personally, I find working at an institution that uses Donna to be really deeply moving. Our society is so thoroughly capitalistic um, and that there are people living their lives and teaching and offering without this kind of economy of exchange, but um, just freely offer their teachings and that we have a community, a Sangha of people who freely offer something out of their hearts in return. It feels like, um, I don't know, capitalism is also at the heart of the sixth extinction. And um, it's like, a, it's an alternative to that. And it's, it's really inspiring. I also wanna say that, um, David does remind me a little of these monks living in the woods and practicing. There is something that is possible as a meditator if you spend 40 or 50 years meditating a lot every day. And there's something that's possible if you have spent 40 or 50 years reading Chinese, studying Chinese. And David has never had a job with benefits. <laughs> never went the secure way that say I did, which includes a lot of distractions of faculty meetings and <clears throat> other sorts of things. He has been totally committed to this work and that has made something possible. <clears throat> it has not made possible health insurance in the same way that some many of us might have. Um, and so this is an invitation to um, offer Donna for David. There will be a link in the chat that Cassie will put or maybe already has. Um, there you go. There's a link in the chat for anybody who's so moved. Um, and there will also be a letter that will go out to everybody who is registered. Um, there will also be an opportunity to leave some feedback for us, the survey that we send out after all our programs. And Cassie, thank you. Just put the link in the chat for that. And that link will also be in the email. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming. I hope that you have some sense of the remarkable work that David does and that if you're unfamiliar with it, that you will um, find, your, find the book that is your particular gate into David's work. There are many of them. Um, I didn't, I wasn't, for some reason I brought, these are all, oh, these are the books that I grabbed off the shelf that I use of David's and uh, there are many, many that he has offered to the world. So thank you so much, everyone. It's lovely to see some familiar faces and thank you, David. And David, maybe you could uh, end the evening with um, some poetry again. Okay. I like the way William says that. David's never had a job. <laughs> um, okay, I thought I'd just, um, read a couple of short poems. One is by Libo, also eighth century. Reverence Pavilion Mountain, sitting alone. The birds have vanished into deep skies. The last cloud drips away, all idleness. Inexhaustible, this mountain and I gaze at each other, it alone remaining. And um, here's one that's a little bit 
a little humor, um, eighth century China, Bo Jui. This is, he's pretty old when he wrote this. There's plenty of food and clothes. My children are married. Now that I'm free and clear of all those duties to the family, I fall asleep at night with the body of a bird reaching forests and eat at dawn with the mind of a monk who begs for meals. A scatter of crystalline voices calls, cranes beneath pines. A single fleck of cold light burns, a lamp in among bamboo. On a sitting cushion, I'm all Chan stillness deep in the night. A, a daughter calls, a wife hoots, no answer, no answer at all. And then I thought I'd end with the same, the, all the same Egret's poem that, so it returns in this event, kind of like it returns in the book. Egret's, robes of snow, crests of snow, and beaks of azure jade, they fish in shadowy streams. Then startling up into flight, they leave emerald mountains for lit distances. Pear blossoms, a tree full, tumble in the evening wind. So thank you, William, and thank you for everyone um, for being here. I'm honored to be part of this. And have a nice night. Thanks so much, David. Good night, everyone.